Those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Then it's passed. We have two resolutions um, this, this afternoon. The first one, I'll do them separately, but the first one is uh, resolution authorizing the general counsel to execute a contract on behalf of the office of the university controller to enter into a contract with a vendor who will offer maintenance services um, regarding air uh, management services. Such purchase shall not exceed an estimated annual total cost of $700,000. The university will use this contract to provide these services uh, for the city university campuses. Do we have a motion? Mm -hmm. So moved. Second. Second. Any questions, comments? All those in favor, say question, aye. Question, question. Oh, sorry, sorry. Oh, Air Hill. management services, could you tell me what that is? Air conditioning? Air conditioning. Aye. Ah, the pneumatic controls that, that <laughs> make it all work. That's right. In another life, we might have known it as HVAC. Uh, yes. 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 Where were we? Do we uh, all in favor say? Yes. Aye. Aye. Any okay. opposed? None. Second resolution is to authorize the general counsel to execute a contract on behalf of the office of the university controller to enter into a contract with the vendor who would provide full book binding services. Questions should be asked. Um, <laughs> such <laughs> purchase shall not exceed an estimated cost of $950,000. The university will use this um, contract to provide book binding services for uh, the city university campus libraries. Do we have a motion? Second. Second. Questions? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Carries. We now move to the audit subcommittee and a presentation of KPMG. Okay. Um, right. Well, good evening, everyone. Um, I'd like to, to introduce um, Barry Kaufman, the controller, who will present um, the partners from KPMG on the, the A133 audit, which is, which is the audit of the university's financial aid programs. So, controller Kaufman. Thank you. Um, I have uh, with us today is uh, Shelley Massey, who's a partner with KPMG, and there are actually two presentations that, uh, that she'll be making. One is on the uh, A133. The second one is on the uh, matters of internal control. Uh, I think you have both of these reports in front of you, so let me ask Shelley to uh, begin with the, uh, uh, the memorandums of, uh, of internal control. Good evening. Um, as Barry mentioned, there are two things on the agenda uh, this evening. The first is the communication of internal control and other operational matters. That is a letter that is addressed to the university controller and does <coughs> include comments that relate to both the colleges as well as the university controller's office. The second is the A133. I'll review the results of that audit. Continuing on page three of the PowerPoint presentation, um, I will begin with the uh, communication of internal control and other operational matters. That is this rather thick document here. Uh, as part of our annual audit, we do visit eight um, of the 19 colleges and perform certain internal control procedures. Those eight colleges are visited on a rotational basis. We do make sure that we visit each of them at least once every three years and make the determination each year as to which eight we will be visiting other than the mandatory rotational requirement. We look at the prior year comments to see if anything significant had arisen in the prior year that we would like to go back and uh, visit again, as well as um, senior management uh, changes that had occurred at the colleges. And we make this decision in conjunction with uh, Barry's office. So there's input on both sides from KPMG um, and from the University Controller's office. And the eight colleges that we visited for the fiscal 07 audit are included here on page three. For the remaining colleges, as part of our review, we do get an update status on the prior year comments to see what kind of correct, corrective action had taken place during the current year. Included on page four are the five processes that we focus on when, we're, when we perform this internal control test work. The first is tuition management. This is a process that looks at the registration and the billing and the collection of tuition and fees. The second is cash management. This looks at the process of budgeting of revenues and expenditures 
and the process of analyzing the budget to actual, as well as the cash reconciliation procedures. The third is procurement and property management. This looks at the procurement of both capital items and non-capital items to ensure that they're being properly recorded and approved. Information technology, we look at the higher level um, IT controls, um, those over access or computer operations. And the last is human resources, where we look at the process in place over the approvals of new hires and terminations <coughs> and how they're being put onto and removed from the payroll system. On page five, we have included three comments in this letter that relate to the University Controller's Office. The first is with respect to recording of liabilities. There was a drawdown that had taken place in May of 2007 in the amount of $6 million that was recorded in October of 2007 as part of their closing process. So it was identified by management, um, however, not uh, recorded into the financial statements until October. Um, part of what we saw was just a communication between various departments that needs to be more timely, and we have recommended that. The second item is with respect to recording of fixed assets. Uh, during our procurement test work, we had made a sample selection of certain items and had noted that one item that was capital was recorded as a non-capital item, and then one item that was non-capital was recorded as capital. The importance here is that the capital items need to be recorded properly so that depreciation expense can be uh, recorded properly during the year. And lastly is the financial aid refunds, and we'll speak a little bit about this when we talk um, about the A133 report, but we did see significant improvement here in this area, uh, but we still noted some instances of refunds that were being remitted back to the federal government um, untimely and inaccurate. So we have uh, continued that comment. On page six, I've included um, some general topics of areas where we have findings um, in internal control matters at the college level. And in each of these areas, I'll just give you a, a couple of um, ideas of, of what kind of things we look for and, and what we found. Uh, under property management, some of the, the findings that we had at the college level um, look look for the timeliness of tagging of inventory. And also there's a transfer a policy that when inventory is moved from one building to another building that a transfer documentation is filled out so that it can be properly recorded into the Insight property management system. And we had noted some um, exceptions there. For procurement, um, we had noted a few instances of um, improper segregation of duties between purchasing and accounts payable. Uh, tuition management. Um, some examples here, some things that we had noted um, were some lack of review of tuition refunds. And we also looked to make sure that the allowance is properly calculated, and we had noted a few instances where that was not properly reviewed. Under cash management, we had noted a few exceptions with the review of cash receipts that are posted to the general ledger as well as the timely turnover of old receivables to collection agencies. There's a policy in place that once receivables are greater than one year old, that they are turned over to a, a collection agency and in a few colleges that it not occurred during the year. With respect to human resource management, again, we look to ensure that new hires and terminations are removed from the payroll system. And we had a few instances where a termination was not removed timely. Uh, with respect to budgeting, uh, we had noted a few cases where the budget to actual report uh, was not being reviewed. And in another instance where certain budget modifications that had been made during the year had not been adjusted on the budget to actual um, schedule that was being analyzed by management. With respect to information technology, we have noted a few instances where disaster recovery plans um, either are not formally in place <coughs> or they have not been tested. And with respect to A133, most of the comments in this area relate to the refund calculations um, for the federal refunds, as well as reporting to um, the National Student Clearinghouse. And in this letter, uh, the colleges have all responded to their respective comments. 
That concludes the part of the presentation on the management letter. <coughs> the second <coughs> item on the agenda is the A133 report that was um, issued last week. And it is this document here. The, the A133 report actually begins on page 72. The financial statements are, and the notes are included in this document as well. And I believe those were reviewed with the committee back in November. So I'm really just going to be focused on the A133 report and the figures. <coughs> this begins on uh, page 7. And our A133 audit is conducted in accordance with United States auditing standards, as well as the standards applicable to financial audits that are contained in government <coughs> auditing standards. Additionally, the compliance aspect of this audit is governed by the federal OMB circular A133. For this aspect of our audit, we do visit all colleges. Um, we make a sample selection from each of them. Um, either five students or ten students get selected from each campus, and that's a determination that's made really based on the level of findings in the prior year. There's one major program that's audited, and that is student financial assistance. The majority of the CUNY federal funds are administered through RF CUNY. So they get a separate audit, and those funds do not flow through CUNY's um, A133 report. Included on page 8 are some of the items that we are required to review each year. The federal government uh, prints and, and distributes to auditors a compliance supplement. It includes, for all of the major federal programs, the compliance includes 14 different compliance requirements. Um, not all of them are applicable for all of the grants, and the auditors also have some discretion if they feel that a compliance requirement is applicable, but it's not material to the program, then that is not audited. So for student financial assistance out of the 14 When a federal government provides um, student financial assistance, they, they expect that the majority um, and probably 99 percent of the funds are actually provided to students in the form of um, aid. Um, and we do make a sample selection and go back to the award letters and the distributions and ensure that that is how the funds are being spent. The next item um, that's a compliance requirement that we um, do look at and is considered material is cash management. We look at the requests that are being made by the university as well as the drawdowns to ensure that the funds have actually been distributed to the students first prior to the requests being made to the federal government as um, they do uh, make their, just, um, their requests and drawdowns on a reimbursement basis. So they're required to, the university is required to distribute the, the funds first and then they get reimbursed. Eligibility, there are many different eligibility requirements that students need to uh, maintain. Um, you know, they need to be a U.S. citizen, they need to maintain a certain GPA to receive certain um, awards, and we do look at that. Matching and earmarking, just a few of the federal assistance programs do have a matching requirement, um, but we do recalculate the requirements to, to ensure that it has been met. Reporting, we do look at certain reports that are submitted by the university and ensure that they're accurate and that they have been reviewed. And then there are various special tests uh, that we look at. These special tests are really what make the um, SFA audit in A133 um, <coughs> rather complicated as far as um, in management's perspective. It's where you're going to find the majority of findings. Um, and just jumping down that the two here that I find at most schools where there's findings is the return of Title IV and the student status changes, where we do look um, at the calculation and the timeliness of these. So on the last page, I have included the current year findings. And I will say that there has been significant improvement. I believe over the past three years, um, the first two have have met the threshold of being uh, a reportable condition. And 
this year, I mean, reportable condition is not the terminology that we use. It's actually significant deficiency. And I think what's more remarkable this year is that a significant <coughs> deficiency at, actually has a higher, or I'm sorry, a lower threshold of being um, a significant deficiency rather than a reportable condition. So the fact that they got rid of the reportable condition and had no significant deficiencies is, um, is really good. We had one out of 183 refunds that was not remitted timely, and that uh, timeliness is 45 days after the withdrawal date. And then for calculations of refunds, we had two out of 183 that were not properly calculated. And then lastly, for student status changes, there was four out of 72 that were not um, submitted timely. And timeliness here is 60 days from the point that the student status change occurred. So I think a really good A133 report, and um, Barry's group is to be complimented. And that concludes that part of the presentation. Great. Shelley, thank you. Comments? Okay. Open it up for questions or comments or any part of the trustees. I just started. <clears throat> I just want to really, you know, th th I can't tell you what a nightmare this is. I mean, <laughs> I mean you have a sense of the size of this university and our budgets. It's okay. Once we're down to $33, um, but even in the past when it was terrible, we were talking about like $800 and $700. It, anyway, um, nobody There's was rushing. There's no materiality right. threshold for right. 33 Nobody was rushing to take this on. Um, everyone was running. This is like, you know, a house on fire. Everyone's trying to get out of the house quickly. Um, Barry Kaufman and Lou and their staffs really rushed into this um, and really got control of this. And I just want to really publicly thank them for this. Um, they did a spectacular. Thank you. Thank you. And, and Sherry, before we, Shelley, excuse me, before we leave. Congratulations. Like the last oh, time you were here, you didn't say partner. Right. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for noticing. That's right. You can always tell private sector okay. people. Okay. Moving right along, we now have uh, reports from uh, vice, the Vice Chancellor regarding um, the budgets and the investment portfolio and other good things like that. Vanessa? Okay. Thank you again and good afternoon again. And, and what a difference two months makes um, since we were last um, together. <laughs> Let me just say, forget everything I said before. Let's just forget about it. Let's just start all over again. The no, seriously. Let me let me just first focus on the on the state of the of the state budget because uh, I'm sure all of you are reading the paper. Um, we're waiting for the white smoke to appear um, before we know um, what exactly is going on in Albany. But let me first take you back to the the the, the, the initial executive budget. <laughs> Uh, Governor, uh, Governor Spitzer had proposed an executive budget for the senior colleges had, that had an overall increase in the appropriation for CUNY of almost $40 million, and, and it represented increases of $52 million, almost $53 million, offset by a $16.7 million reduction that was being recommended as part of a statewide initiative of budget reductions to deal with the budget challenge that the state was, at the time, arguing was a $4.4 billion deficit, and there was an additional uh, reduction of $3.1 million associated with a $50 reduction in base aid per FTE for the community colleges. So from in the initial executive budget back in January, February, we were facing that $20 million challenge, and the, as is the, the process, the, the chancellor uh, testified before the assembly I read and Senate Ways, Assembly Ways and Means and Senate Finance Committee on the the, the impact that such a budget would have on the university and reiterated the university's proposal um, for the compact and the need to make investment at the university. Um, well, as many of you know, the, 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 city, the, the situation in the economy simply worsened considerably, and the Governor Spitzer issued a 30-day amendment that reduced revenues by another $374 million, um, although there were no additional reductions that were imposed on the community, on the senior or the community colleges. The conditions deteriorated even further. Uh, and now Governor Patterson, uh, upon assuming on the responsibility for the budget, ordered another set of $800 million in budget reductions against state operations. And, and, and that, that amounted for CUNY to, on top of the 16.7, an additional $20.6 million cut, proposed cut to the senior colleges. 
and a 2% reduction in aid to community colleges for another $3.5 million. So now we were staring at roughly $37 million in cuts at the senior colleges and about 5 and a half to $6 million in cuts to the community colleges. Um, and, and that's where the governor began budget negotiations with the Senate and the Assembly. That was last week. Uh, in, in the ensuing week, the, the legislative leaders agreed on a budget framework. Um, this budget framework added dollars um, for the legislature to consider to manage various pieces of the budget and included an additional billion dollars in spending. And, and the way in which the, the process in Albany works, they break up into subcommittees uh, or, or to committees to deal with the various budgets, an education committee, a health committee, mental health committee, um, a higher ed committee, and a public protection committee. Um, they were given a billion dollars. Education, the K through 12 system, was given um, $400 million to sort of consider adding various initiatives. The, the health committee was given 275. A few other things were sprinkled around. The higher ed committee was given $90 million. Uh, now, the higher ed committee was given $90 million uh, to solve $155 million in cuts. And, and, I, and the only cuts that I mentioned were cuts to CUNY. I didn't mention to you cuts to SUNY. Cuts mm. to the private, cuts to TAP that were also included as part of the budget challenges in the, in the executive budget and in the budget that was announced by or the additional $800 million that Governor Patterson had proposed. So you have $155 million in problems and only $90 million to solve them. And they've been at it for a couple of days now, maybe three or four. And as of a half hour ago, I think, they have still not yet resolved how they were going to deal with the, with the higher ed component. Um, they, they've settled the issues of school aid. Um, so if you're interested in the school, in the school system, the aid went up um, from an additional 1.4 to $1.8 billion in additional school aid. And so there are clearly no reductions there. Um, but we're still waiting to see what the final determination is. But understand that it's $90 million trying to solve $155 million. So those, there's no serious expectation that we're going to be made whole in this budget. And, and the only real issue for us at this point is what's going to be the size of the challenge. Is it going to be back to the executive budget recommendation that has 16.7, or is it going to be something worse than that? And we'll be able to report to you the next time we meet. I'm sure the Chancellor will issue a communication to all the trustees on exactly the state of the adopted budget and the steps that we will take to, to, to manage it. But that's, that's where we are with, with the state. Complicating things just a little bit is the fact that the City of New York is also looking for additional support from the state to solve a number of other problems. And many, of, some of you may have seen an article in the Daily News that, that sort of suggested that the, state, the City of New York was prepared to do yet another round of cuts uh, to city agencies, including CUNY, if they weren't satisfied with the, the revenues that they were going to get from the state, or in this case, um, was particularly um, difficult for the mayor to accept is that the legislature wanted to um, direct the city of New York <coughs> that they could not make any reductions in the education system, thus hampering the ability of the city budget managers from dealing with the budget. And since the mayor had already made recommendations of about $324 million in cuts to the school system, um, they were saying that if they could not do those cuts, they would have to revisit all the other cuts to all the other agencies. And so we face potential challenges, even greater challenges, that we had already had on, on the city. And let me remind you just for a second what, what those were. The, the mayor's preliminary budget included about $30 million in cuts to the community colleges and an additional $24 million in cuts to other programs that were outside of the community colleges but included and include the Bologna Scholarship Program, the Safety Net Program, funding for centers and institutes, and the like. And, and the city council, um, they are in the process now reviewing that. Chancellor Gosin testified before the higher ed committee on the impact that these budget reductions would have on the community colleges. And, and so now we will await what the, how the mayor absorbs the adopted budget on the state of New York as he prepares the actual executive budget from the city of New York, which is not due to be released until the end of April or early May. And then and only then we will know what the scope of the challenges are for the community colleges. Uh, and, and the chancellor will again uh, testify before the city council and the, well, before the city council and also before the borough presidents on, on the budget matters for the community colleges. So that sort of brings you up to date on where, where I wish I can give you more information on what's going on in Albany, uh, but I don't yet know. Um, I, I can just very briefly just, I don't have all the details on the capital budget, but let me just say that 
the, during the, the conferees discussions, the assembly had um, recommended uh, additional revenues of up to of over seven hundred million dollars in capital funds. I remind you for a moment that the that the governor's executive budget had a decent um, but inadequate capital budget for the university. It only included about nine hundred and sixty million dollars, uh, and we have several billion dollars shortfall to meet the budget requests um, that we had sought for on the capital side. And the Senate um, had zero in their capital recommendations because they were awaiting negotiations with the assembly. So. It is it's still a very important matter on the capital side. It's, it's a good um, starting point, I think, that the, that the assembly was recommending add-ons. We've gotten good um, signals from the executive that they were prepared to entertain additional items on the capital budget. So it'll, I think it'll get better. Um, how much better, it's, it's unknown, and we probably won't know until tonight at 2 o'clock in the morning. If any of you are still around, we'll, uh, we'll send you a, a fax. Uh, but if there's any questions on this, I would be happy to, to answer them. I would just add um, one little piece of, of, of what Ernesto's very good presentation was, that we will get a budget uh, very soon, perhaps uh, as early as within the next 24 hours. But I think that's really the opening salvo here uh, as uh, revenues continue to deteriorate. And they have deteriorated uh, quite substantially, and that has not been made public. Uh, I would anticipate a further look at the adopted budget, uh, perhaps even earlier than it uh, will be adopted, th than it would be implemented on July 1st. So we, we have to not only think about maximizing our position in the next 24 to 36 hours, but really need to reflect that shortly thereafter there is likelihood that uh, this would have to take uh, an, another look at. And next year, uh, one of the reasons that, uh, you know, we were able to get away not as bad as, you know, typically you would is that you had about two-thirds of the fiscal year that were in pretty good shape. And so this is a very dynamic time, very dicey time, and it's going to take um, uh, a lot of uh, elan and um, and wisdom to really get through this over you know maybe the next 18 months. This is not a you know a, a, a budget that will be that we'll have to deal with uh, in the next several hours. It's going to be something that's going to require constant vigilance and thinking about how to generate revenue uh, in ways that we haven't generated revenue in the past few years, so it's, it's going to take a lot of work. Robert. Yes. Um, would one of the steps be to have the tuition increase that was proposed, or is that will be the last step that you think the university would take? I don't think this budget will be um, betting a tuition increase in it, but uh, I think as we look for, as we look prospectively, uh, this is the only university that I am aware of, any public university certainly that I'm aware of, that has gone six years without a tuition increase. You just cannot run an organization where expenses are increasing and revenue is flat or decreasing. It's just a, it is a non-viable way to run a university, and that's why we have proposed the compact, which was very strenuously addressed by both SUNY and CUNY, and hopefully that is going to live uh, in the next several months after we get through this rather traumatic period. So I, I don't want to sugarcoat this, uh, Robert, but tuition is an issue that will have to be addressed in this state by SUNY and CUNY and have to be addressed soon, uh, but I don't envisage that it's going to be addressed in the budget that will be adopted in the next day or so, hopefully. I think the, the thing to look for um, is the, the independent fiscal monitors after this budget is adopted um, and see what they say and, and how they weigh in. If, if they weigh in and, and suggest that, that all the numbers add up, that the revenues 
are that were are there are reasonable that there's very little risk in those things not occurring then we may be able to get through fiscal 09 without any additional modifications if on the other hand they all you know have that look on their face and, and clearly say and begin suggesting that those numbers are not adding up then we can reasonably expect to see uh, and we haven't seen this in in a considerable number of years at CUNY uh, mid-year reductions in which the executive the legislature will do what they do and they'll go home and and run for re-election and anything that that worsens the situation becomes simply the governor's problem and the governor as the governor of the state of New York as, as circumstances dictate and revenues begin to deteriorate has the ability and the power um, without legislative approval to take state agencies and the senior colleges fall under the category the rubric of the state supported enterprise to make reductions in the available funds to the university they can't do that with the community colleges because they fall into the local assistance account. But for the state agencies, they have the ability to basically put the squeeze on and, and direct the budget offices of the university that you only have 98% of the revenues that were appropriated and already begin to do that. Uh, we will assess the situation. We don't have to decide anything today. Uh, we will know where we're at by the end of June in terms of planning the financial plan for 09. And as the chancellor alluded, um, you know, being very smart about how we approach the 2010 budget request that this trustee, th this group will be dealing with in September and October, and what exactly the message that we present to the governor and the executive as they deal with what is likely to be a continuing deterioration in the revenues and, and the extent to which a national recession hits um, and the, how deep that recession is. And you can always track for the past 30 years when it is that the, the most significant budget pressures that befall on the university are, you know, very, you know, um, coincide with the national recessions. And whether it's 1982, 83, under Reagan, 92, under Bush, you can really track it. And we're going to keep a very close eye on it. Um, and as the Chancellor said, at the, at the appropriate time, we'll come up with a financial plan that meets the challenges and continues to make the kind of investments that I think we all believe we need to continue to make at this university, that it is not in our interest to contract, to go backwards, to eliminate. to go backwards and we're not we're not in that mood we're not in that posture and we will come up with a financial plan that in these challenging times allow us to to move forward but we'll see yes it professor certainly Phil. would be regrettable if there were a tuition increase coupled with loss of support to the university that would affect mean that the Losses and in the past we've had losses in faculty members in this well, uh, in times like this and that has resulted in lasting damage. But I'd like to remind you of what we did in 2003. However, that in 2003 we faced a substantial challenge. Um, Governor Pataki had recommended 100 million dollars in reductions, uh, and, we, and you know we came up with a revenue policy. We had to raise tuition. But the growth of the 1,000 faculty that the chancellor has helped create over the past um, seven or eight years um, happened during um, post-9-11 recession and, and a very difficult time. So we, we know how to do this uh, in a way that doesn't you know, compromise the, the university. Okay. And that's one report. Okay. One final piece. Um, I'd like to first um, ask Barry to, to ask our uh, chief investment advisor to, uh, to come to the table. I have given you a memorandum um, that sort of spells out um, that, that Janet Crone, our, our new um, add to the staff, um, provided me um, and the chancellor on, on giving you an update. Uh, obviously, a lot has been happening in the, in the market, and it's, it's our responsibility to give you a a sense of what that means to the university's portfolio, where we are exactly right now, and also have some recommendations. So I'd like first for Barry to, to uh, introduce Janet, and Janet, if you can just go over briefly um, your memo to me, and we can have the committee debate. Well, thank you. I'm, uh, I'm very pleased to introduce uh, Janet Crone to the uh, committee. Uh, we uh, went through a uh, fairly rather extensive search. Uh, and uh, Janet emerged as the um, as the uh, 
a unanimous choice of the search committee that we had recommended to uh, Ernesto. Janet uh, is an experienced uh, investment uh, professional. She uh, has spent a number of years at uh, Con Edison uh, working on their investments and directing their, their uh, investments for their pension plan. Uh, she has been at the Pennsylvania State University uh, as well as with some private investment firms as well. Uh, and um, we uh, just look forward to uh, having Janet participate in the uh, work of the, uh, of the university, being a member of, of the budget and finance team. Uh, and quite frankly, I think that the memo that she has uh, prepared uh, in the short time that she's been here uh, shows the kind of expertise that we're all looking to, uh, to have. So uh, I welcome Janet and ask Thank her you. to give a brief summary of the uh, of her memo. Um, we all know we're in very challenging times in terms of the economy and, and the capital markets. Um, the returns in every asset class, save for some areas of the negative. Uh, the same applies to industry subsectors, that the only positive performing sector has been the energy sector. Um, our portfolio um, has taken the bumps along with these markets, and um, we are in the process of actively speaking to our managers. Uh, we have completed a review of a request for proposal for a consultant. Uh, we hope to bring the finalists before and uh, upon completion of that search, uh, we will move right on to looking at the investment policy with an eye towards um, making some revisions there as well as the asset allocation to uh, position us for the long term in a very positive way. Okay, let me just uh, add very quickly, the, on the last page of the memorandum, uh, we, we, we would like to, and, and on page two you'll see that we, the, we took a 7.5% hit um, over the past three months, and, and there's a reason for that, and, and among the reasons is the significant underperforming of our, our value holder, the Oppenheimer. And, and so we don't, we don't frankly want to wait until the investment subcommittee hears from a consultant. I think we're ready to, we're prepared to make a recommendation now. Um, that we move the $23 million that we have in Oppenheimer value and move it into an index fund. And so we'd like to, to make at least that recommendation. And Janet, if you can talk about the, the other recommendation that we have there in terms of the, uh, uh, the tracking um, system you want to impose as well. I'd appreciate it if you could talk about that. But the key that I'd like to, to get your sense um, and your thoughts on is whether or not um, you agree that it's time to move now on Oppenheimer or do you think it you wish to wait until the consultant. I would recommend that we move now, but I will defer to, to the committee. Jenna, why don't you explain the tracking a little bit? Uh, the tracking error is another uh, risk measure that one can superimpose upon a manager in addition to saying we, you know, your performance objective is to exceed a certain benchmark by X amount. Um, by imposing a tracking error benchmark, you're saying that you basically don't want them to deviate from the benchmark by X amount. And so they will probably look to the sectors that they're invested in and more closely mirror the sectors that are represented in the larger benchmark. <coughs> what I've seen with uh, many of our domestic equity portfolios, very little exposure to the energy area. And I suspect that in imposing a tracking error benchmark, for example, you might see that increase come closer to that of the benchmark. Um, and basically you're saying to a manager, you know, we're, we're, we're looking at the performance, we expect you to outperform, we're paying active management fees, and if you can't beat the benchmark, we're going to go with an index fund. So I think it's, it's a good risk measure to superimpose upon a manager. Information. Certainly. Certainly. 
That's right. Mm -hmm. We could go first to the managers or to the current consultant, get information on the current tracking error with our existing managers as a first step. Um, and then proceed to meet with the individual managers and see if there are, you know, where the deviations occur, where we are seeing something that we wouldn't expect. The guidelines currently do not contain a tracking error, but as you say, they probably do follow this, uh, but unless it's clearly specified, they might be taking on more risk uh, than we would, we would prefer. Um, you would hope that they wouldn't, but if it ranges. that would be if, if it was with a mutual fund. These are separately managed, except for one. I think it's the international portfolio is a mutual fund. Um, other than that, they are separately managed funds on a discretionary basis. And my understanding of the investment guidelines at this point are they're pretty broad. Mm -hmm. They are very broad. Right. They're very broad. And they're, very broad. they're certainly not specific to each manager, right. which is another thing that I think down the road we need to address. Are there any questions? Okay. No, I, I, I concur with the Chancellor because we've gone through this so many times. When you get involved with discretionary authority, uh, Risk you do. It leaves us uh, very highly exposed, um, and so when you have a, a mutual fund manager, uh, they know the parameters with which they can they can work in. So, I would say I wouldn't want to wait until a consultant comes in, especially in light of where we are now um, with the economy. Um, I would say move out of the uh, you know the large cap value uh, as soon as we can. Yeah, I was just going to ask a question. Um, to explain the, the distinction, why, why move now on the Oppenheimer but not the Zeffenberger fund, since the losses seem similar in magnitude? I, I think part of it is the, the, the consistent underperforming of Oppenheimer over the two-year period. Um, Zeffenberger just recently started to tank, um, but over the past two years, Zeffenberger wasn't. And, and I think it, otherwise I would I would wait until we may actually end up doing that mm -hmm. at the subcommittee. <coughs> uh, but I didn't think it, it warranted actions outside of the subcommittee review. Um, that's primarily that any other reason other than that, Barry? Well, I think that um, that Oppenheimer represents about fourteen percent of the pool and uh Zevenberg is about uh seven percent. So there's right, there's both those reasons. One the size of the of yeah. the exposure and and the length of time. Uh, you can go back three years and Oppenheimer um, has been underperforming. And that's mm -hmm. But we can clearly, uh, a month from now, six months, six weeks, whenever we meet, we, we probably would probably make a similar recommendation. I agree um, that the Oppenheimer has been performing horribly over the last two years and the, the last one year performance is staggering. Um, we, something needs to happen. Do we need to do this in the form as a subcommittee, or do we need to do this to give the chancellor the power to do this? How, how does I this think I think the latter. I think when we meet as a subcommittee on the advisors and all that, we will need a formal resolution. But this group, I think, could simply delegate to the chancellor uh, the recommended the recommendations that are on the table right now. Okay. Do speed. Do speed. Yes, let's start. Agreed. Let's start tomorrow. Questions? Yes. Is, is the intent for Oppenheimer large cap value or large cap growth, or both? Large cap value only. 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 Yes. Right. Regarding the subcommittee, um, which uh, uh, includes me as well as uh, Trustee Pacilli and um, and Beal, uh, we'll be canvassing our schedule to us have a meeting real soon because uh, now um, that we have Janet on board and um, um, and the RFPs are in, we're going right. to meet quickly. There are some prospects on here that we've seen before, huh? we've dealt with before, have reasons not to accept them. Right. Well, right now the, 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 the 10 are being scored by a, a separate procurement committee that we established, um, and now Janet will um, lend her expertise to, to arrive at, at really the top two or three, because at the end of the day, it's, 
generally that's how it works. Two or three, everybody's in the middle, then a few lag behind. I've gone through it already. And then we'll, we'll, we'll probably have to set up about, you know, a four or five hour meeting of the committee to, to go through it carefully. Can I, can I just ask uh, Janet, what are some of the, the um, parameters for uh, investment advisors? Are you looking at alternative investments as well and the track record with them? Cannot be that, that one cannot ignore. Um, it, it's an area that we would we would like to do a very critical analysis of. I wouldn't waste too much time. Okay. Okay. I don't think you really qualify. Okay. Right. It'll be fund the funds. Fund the funds. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> right. We don't qualify. So we did, we need a motion to give the chancellor just a sense. Well, let me. Does anybody disagree with the situation with us? Okay. Then uh, we, the Chancellor has the, the permission or the power to move with great speed. That's all I have. That's it. Anything, any other issues for the committee? Great. Janet, thank you and welcome aboard. Thank you, Janet. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Meeting adjourned. I'm weird. Close it up the vote. The computer operations down at John Jay. Once a day. Okay. Let me ask you a question. What's more, honey? When yeah. I drive you across the Brian Bridge, and let's say I want to go to the Bronx or West Yes. No, no, no. I drive on the FDR Drive up to the Triborough.